Joe Yoon, thanks so much for coming by the Bar Bend office today. You're kind of on, we're recording this in the middle of a whirlwind trip for you. You were on another podcast right before this. You're talking to everyone in the fitness industry. What have been some highlights on this trip for you? Yeah, so I came from uh, a well-known strength and conditioning coach over in Jersey, uh, Joe DeFranco, works with a lot of the WWE guys, mm -hmm. probably yeah. most well-known for training Triple H. And then I just came back from your buddy uh, Jordan Syatt's, uh podcast, and and I've known him for a long time, or you know, a couple of years now. And uh, fun fact, he actually named my book. Over oh, really? Here. Yeah, yeah, so it was really cool. Um, so I stopped by him or his place with uh, his buddy Mike. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's Mike Vicanti, right? Mike Vicanti, yeah. yeah. They've been, uh, as you know, very uh, Gary V's trainer for the past so many years mm -hmm, and yeah. uh, just amazing guys. Jordan, it's so interesting. I first met Jordan when he was a college student and not to get too much in the weeds, but it's just yeah, such yeah. a small world. He's been on the Barbin podcast before. He's worked on uh, with us on a lot of content. Seeing him go from record holding power lifter, a guy lifting four times his body weight, training at West Side Barbell, Crazy. to now being just very big name, kind of broader fitness influencer, his evolution in taking the lessons from being a hardcore powerlifter and then now reaching a much broader audience. It's, it's been really cool to see that evolution. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of his and how he uh, presents his information because again, we, we're very similar where we like to take, I think the complex uh -huh. and simplify it so yeah. it's very usable for you know the gen general person but also the seasoned athlete as well. And that's one thing I, I like about your content and I kind of want to go into that. Mm -hmm. So I, I actually didn't know your last name until a few days ago. <laughs> I just knew you as at Joe Therapy. Everyone's like, that's your full name, Joe Therapy. Yeah. And someone commented a couple days ago, uh, I said, massage therapy session by Joe Yoon. And they're like, that's your last name? <laughs> Uh, uh, Mr. Therapy is my father. <laughs> I, I just go by Joe. Exactly. Call so me I mean, Joe. <laughs> it, it, it's, it makes a lot of sense, and it, it has become your brand, Joe Therapy. And even before we, we were we started chatting about you coming in, doing a podcast, recording, recording some content, I, I'd seen your stuff. It's, mm -hmm. it's very recognizable. Obviously, it features you. You're in pretty much right. everything you do, which not a lot of folks necessarily do online. You will get a lot of people who talk about prehab exercises, accessory work, and they'll always have kind of a model athlete sure sure demonstrating this stuff but when you demonstrate it could be a particular sweat stretch prehab rehab some kind of movement you are your own model you're demonstrating pretty much everything has it always been that way and have you thought about oh maybe i should bring in some other influencer or some other athlete to kind of be the model but why are you why are you your own model basically is my question it was almost out of necessity because uh, it's very easy just to pop up the camera mm -hmm. and record yourself and then put information out there uh, instead of always having someone there to be the model right. or collaborate with. So it was, it was very easy and it was, you know, back in the day when I was starting my social media, it was all about consistency and putting out information on a daily basis. Uh, and I was busy on top of it, so I was doing other things and doing social media, I guess, more on the side. Uh, so it was just a convenience factor, and it was never easy for me to get in front of the camera either. Uh, but doing it in the comfort of my home, you know, in my apartment was a very easy thing to do because uh, no one was watching me either. So I, got, I always got a little nervous when there's multiple people in the room and I was trying to do something, so... Did you ever did you ever worry I mean or do you ever still worry that someone's going to call you out because maybe you're not as strong in one position or you have a, an imbalance and you're not as mobile in something that you're demonstrating like there's there's this level of social proof there mm -hmm. That's I definitely get called out often uh, but I also try to tell people that first of all every person's body is different mm -hmm. it's uh, anatomically different uh, we all are at different levels. Uh, and also, you know, I only want to be as mobile or flexible as I want to be, what I want to accomplish. Not everyone wants to be the yoga instructor flexibility level. You know, maybe I just want to squat uh, with good form. Uh, maybe I just want to be able to swing that golf club mm -hmm. with enough rotation so I don't tweak my back too much. Uh, so when people, and again, I don't really get too many people who call me out, but they're like, man, you don't look like the picture on the left where <laughs> they're squatting ass to grass. And I'm like, well, I got like long femurs and it's a little bit different. I'm, you know, I'm taller than it looks in, you know, in, on my videos. Uh, so I always try to come back to it and it's like, it's not wrong. It's just different.
I it's interesting because right after we record this podcast, we're going to record some videos mm-hmm. and talk about some of your favorite stretches and and exercises for strength athletes. And I'm a little nervous because my mobility around the barbed <laughs> office is notoriously poor. Um, so I'm interested to be kind of called out on video, and I'm sure I'll get those those comments. But um, you know, you mention being as mobile as you want to be. And so there's always this end goal we have as strength athletes, even if you're not necessarily a competitive athlete and you're mm-hmm. just looking to get stronger. Rarely are people thinking to themselves, I want to squat as deep as possible. Exactly. They're thinking, I want to squat well and I want to make progress in it and feel better at it. What do you think people overcomplicate or maybe overestimate when it comes to building mobility and flexibility? Yeah, I think a lot of the times we put uh, these kind of like parameters, like you have to be this mobile. And it really is sport dependent. If you're a barbell athlete and maybe you're in more of the weightlifting, Olympic lifting type of work, you have to almost be at those extremes. It's true. Yeah, weightlifters want to be able to squat as deep as possible to catch the barbell. It's going to help make your body more efficient. It might cut down on compensating. So you need to have super mobile ankles. Your T-spine has to be able to extend a ton so you can get into that amazing overhead position. Um, For me, I like to be able to get into those positions, but for me, it's not necessarily loading in those positions. So it really has to be what sport you're doing. And uh, again, like checking what your body is capable of doing. Is it a mobility issue? Is it a stability issue? Is it just your body hates being in that position? Yeah. You got to figure it out, uh, which I think a lot of people, they see their favorite athlete and maybe they're not at the pro level yet and they're just trying to, they aspire to be the best, mm-hmm. but maybe their body just cannot get into that position. It's really tough to get uh, to that ideal position that they want to. And, and I think that when we when I see, and I follow a lot of people in the fitness industry because it's, it's what I do, mm-hmm. I see a lot of mobility gurus, right? <laughs> yeah, and yeah. they use themselves as, as examples and they're getting into these like contortion-like positions. I mean, these positions that, that frankly, I know at this point are never going to be achievable for me yep. just because of my body parameters. My femurs are a bit longer. Like I'm just never going to be able to hit those positions. And I think there's something really cool about what you do. And you mentioned it in the first few minutes of this podcast, like you have long femurs. You're a pretty tall guy, yeah. right? <laughs> You're not going to be able to hit some of these positions that you might see, you know, uh, a 49 kilo Olympic weightlifter mm-hmm. hitting. And I think there's something really cool about that because I look at what you do and I understand that you know, you're not taking this necessarily for granted. You've had to build competency in these positions and you know what it's like to have some mobility restrictions and to not be able to hit some positions. I think when someone is so flexible, first of all, they might have been born with it. And usually people who are good at something uh, or born with it, it's uh, they find more interest in it because they're better <laughs> at it, <laughs> right? It's they're just genetically gifted. Um, nothing wrong with that at all. Yeah, um, God, God bless them. Like. Exactly. I wish I was as mobile as some of these other people, um, but it it can also be intimidating. And you know, I wanted to reach as many people as possible and be relatable, um, and make sure that the content I'm putting out there, it's not. Holy crap! He has his, you know, leg behind his head. I'm never going to be able to do that. Oh, well, you know, I'll give you some progressions so you can get to maybe where you want to get to. And if that is Olympic lifting, or that could just be doing a proper box squat uh, because you're just starting out and you have lack of mobility, but you're trying to work your way up. This is kind of a, a tough question, and I don't want to ask a gotcha question, <laughs> but. What is kind of the elevator pitch for your current approach to mobility when it comes to working with with clients or people reading your content? It's all personalized because I've worked with, especially with my social media, I get everyone from someone who just works at a desk or is a truck driver, is a hairdresser, and they just have some certain issues with their bodies. And then I also have the highest level of athlete. And I've actually, um, you know, I do the social media, but I'm also a massage therapist for a lot of top Olympians and NFL athletes. And their goals are all different. Mm. So my elevator pitch is how mobile do you want to be? And what, you know, what do you need from a mobility standpoint? to be the best at what you want to accomplish. If that's just being able to stand all day um, and not be in pain or just do some 
you know, simple exercises. If you go to your group class on the weekends, that's great. Right. If you want to be Olympic level athlete, gold medalist, make it to the Super Bowl, what do you have to do to get to that point? Mm -hmm. And again, it's it's a not a it doesn't everything doesn't fit into just one mold or one box. It's different for everyone. Before we continue on, I want to talk a little bit about terminology. And I've used them interchangeably, these two phrases, um, which is perhaps not correct. So I kind of want to stop myself. Mobility versus flexibility. Can, can you talk about how you view those two terms and if you view them differently, what those differences are? Yeah, I mean, I th even myself in the past early on when I was you know, personal training and talking to clients, I would use them interchangeably, not really understanding what the difference is. Uh, but with you know more studies coming out, and you know everyone is being becoming a expert in certain fields, uh, you know flexibility is more of the passive stretch, uh, where the mobility it's more active, where you're actually moving through a range of motion instead of just maybe just standing there and holding a position for a long time. Mm -hmm. well, now, which is a prerequisite? For, for which, because I've heard it both ways. I've heard some people hmm. say, oh, you have to prioritize mobility first. Then I've had others say, heard that you, you know, say you have to prioritize flexibility first in order to achieve the mobility. Is, it's a chicken, it seems like a chicken and egg situation to me, but maybe you can, how yeah. do you think of that? Actually, I've never had someone ask me that question before. Um, it's because I, just, I combine both of them mm -hmm. in whatever I'm doing. It's never one certain thing. It's not just doing a mobility exercise and moving through that range of motion. If doing a passive stretch or a static stretch helps you get into uh, a mobility exercise better or easier, mm -hmm. then I say go for it. But you know, I think, again, you can use them interchangeably because, uh, or do one before the other because it's probably going to help whatever you're doing on the other side of things. So maybe flexibility first, and then if that helps you move better in your mobility exercise, I think that would be pretty good. Kind of like you do your mobility exercises first, then you go into your strengthening, and then you go into your power exercises, kind of that, uh, kind of that uh, hierarchy. It's interesting, and for, for those listening, if you kind of want to dive more into that, uh, someone who, who I think really does a good job separating the two out in the work he does, which is which is very very different. He's kind of targeting different audiences. Mm. Is Dr. Jordan Shallow? I was just uh, talking to someone about him the other day. I think uh, he went on Joe DeFranco's show. Yeah, he, he's actually been on our podcast twice. Oh, cool. And he's been in a bunch of bar bend videos. He's he's a he's a. I call him a good friend of the brand. At the same time, uh, he's like this very cool guy, and I want to call him like a personal friend, but yeah. he's like maybe too cool for me. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. He, he's an amazing guy. He's an amazing thinker, amazing athlete, internationally elite power lifter and just one of the one of the smartest people you'll ever talk yeah. to when it comes to strength and and fitness and um, the way he conceptualizes mobility versus flexibility uh, and and he's he can talk all day about how you know most people are misinterpreting warm-ups and are not warming up correctly sure. for their for their requisite activities and things like that so um, if you're listening and you're looking for more info and, and a, another take on that mobility versus flexibility question, the Barbend podcasts, because there are two of them with Jordan Shallow, <laughs> uh, pretty good resource for that. Uh, back to Joe. <laughs> the thing is, I love hearing about other professionals because yeah. I'm, you know, I'm not the person always digging into research mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, my uh, the people who follow me a lot. Are, you know, it's more general pop, but you do get the athletes too. But a lot of my friends is where I get a lot of my you know, current information right. from, you know, I'm still looking into it, but these guys absolutely love the science behind everything, the evidence-based work. Yeah. So I love going out and talking to these people who are way smarter than I am, who went through way more education than I did. Um, it's amazing. I love how you can hear things just in one place, like the podcast, and you can listen to all these people from different, you know, different avenues. One thing I, I really want to do more of in, in the Barb Inn podcast, and so ex if you're listening to this, hopefully expect some more <laughs> of this in the future, is putting people in conversation on these topics, right? We've done that a couple of times so far. We actually had Jordan, Dr. Jordan Shallow and uh, Dr. Pat Davidson in conversation uh, in this very room oh, okay, where cool. we're recording now. And that, yeah. that was a really cool, like you can kind of see the sparks fly in a good way. Not that they're like at each other's throats, but the conversation, there's, there's a push and pull. Because even if you agree with someone on a concept in strength and conditioning, it's so nuanced mm -hmm. that your interpretation and the way you communicate those ideas, it's going to vary from person to person inevitably. I've talked to so many 
people that I put on, you know, that I really uh, just really like and I admire and they are very smart, but they'll have just a little bit of a different take on certain things. It's not necessarily that it's wrong, it's just preference and maybe experience. So uh, that's one thing I've learned growing in this industry is you always have to play devil's advocate. It's mm -hmm. never trying to put yourself in a box because when I first started, I would take a continuing education course and then I would follow all of his buddies and then I only <laughs> believed in one thing and I'm like, and then a couple of years later, they're like, well, what about this? And I'm like, no, that's so stupid. This person said this. And then I was like, oh, maybe that actually does make sense. So it's, it's, really, it's really awesome to make sure that you listen to so many different people and then use your own you know, personal education and your you know, thought process to figure out what's best for you. One thing that Jordan Syed actually <coughs> talked, uh, to taught me and this is when Jordan's younger than me and in many ways much more accomplished and much smarter than I'll ever be, there are many different ways to say the same thing mm -hmm. to the same person, especially if you're working with clients. Right. And Jordan's very big on, that's true when you discuss evidence-based fitness, it's true when you, like we're all often in agreement, it's just we're phrasing things differently. Exactly. And coaches have a lot of experience with that. Like Jordan, I know, Jordan's side is very big on internal versus external cueing, right? Like for a squat. Keep your chest up, maybe not the best cue for everyone. Show me the letters on your shirt. <laughs> a great cue he uses all the time, right? I, said, I watched one of his recent videos that show your nipples to the, the wall. <laughs> He's, he, it's, it's actually gotten more explicit as <laughs> that cue. He, he, the first, I think when he first coached it, it was like, keep your chest up. Then it was like, okay, expand your chest. Mm -hmm. Show me the letters on your shirt. Now it's just like, point your nipples at the wall. <laughs> like, just re, there's it, a, if it gets to the point across. It's like the, it works. Th there's no nuance there. There's mm -hmm. not. There's nothing left there. When it comes to internal versus external cueing and how you communicate to clients, what are some of the challenges you have to overcome, and what are some methods you use to overcome those? Yeah. So, in my practice in Orlando, it's uh, more massage therapy based or sports massage therapy based, where I work on a lot of powerlifters, CrossFitters, regular athletes, just everyone. Right. And. One of the toughest things to do is, especially since these are new people, I mean, some of the people you just never met, is building a good relationship and making sure that you break down some of their barriers coming in. And just, just to clarify, <laughs> new working with you, but they're not necessarily new exactly. athletes. Okay. And just trying to figure out how they learn because sometimes people like the explanations. Right. <clears throat> and then some people like the very simple. It's like, Joe, don't tell me any of this shit. Just, <laughs> just tell me what to do and you know, I'll do it. But some people like, oh, what you know, what muscles working and um, what's the action for this position? Uh, but I love the the way of like, if you're teaching a squat, and I don't teach that much. I know the basics, um, and I know I, I probably know more than the basics. But I let the people who spend most of their time in strength training take care of that stuff. Uh, but yeah, spreading your feet apart, you know, to make sure your glutes are firing during the squat. Um, you know, push your hips back to the wall. You know, that type of stuff I think is a little bit better for people to understand from, you know, most of the population. So say I'm a, a power lifter. Say I live in Orlando, Florida. Mm -hmm. I would never live in Orlando. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, it's chill. I do it's, like New York though. It's great. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just a, I, I gotta be, it's, it's too hot for me down there. <laughs> anyway, uh, but say I'm a power lifter in Orlando, Florida, mm -hmm. and I come to you and I have some mobility restrictions that are, I think are preventing me from reaching optimal positions in the squat, bench press, deadlift. Um, by the way, I do think mobility restrictions matter more in the deadlift than a lot of people think, just my, oh, yeah, my yeah. opinion. Um, you know, what is going to be an initial assessment that you might do on me? Like, what's that going to look like? Yeah, so the first thing, again, like everyone's different, everyone's, you know, customized, and you want to make sure, uh, first of all, like, how are they moving? Uh -huh. Is show me how are you deadlifting? And I will not touch technique that much, unless it's probably going to hurt you. Right. Uh, there are some great coaches down in Orlando. One is, I can't, uh, Carmargo. Carmargo. Oh, yeah, Danny Carmargo. Yeah. He's also been on our podcast. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, and we've done some, we've been lucky to have him on uh, in some USA weightlifting events that Barbin's involved with. He's a guest color commentator, so whip smart guy, great athlete, fantastic coach. So, I mean, there are some high level coaches down in, you know, around the area that I'm at. And I get some of these people like, oh, you work with Carmen? Go, awesome. So I don't even have to worry about technique. Right, That's right. not my place to tell people, which I think a lot of professionals, they might inject themselves in 
uh, a little too much. Really? Okay. Yeah, I think sometimes they're like, you got to do this. And then the coach is like, you got to do this. Right. And just being in athletics, uh, that's that's pretty detrimental to your career. You, de- you definitely don't want to overstep the coaches unless it's a real big issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, I'll have someone come in. Hey, what are you having issues with? Uh, you know, I'm struggling to get my butt all the way down the ass to grass, and my I'm getting a little bit of a butt wink. And you know, then you just got to check, check your ankles, check your T spine, just kind of figure out where they're at, and then attack. I always like to attack the obvious uh, issues. Okay. You know, what's the big glaring ones? You know, ankles are a pretty big one in any type of weightlifting. Uh, so make sure the ankles are good. How's the calves doing? Uh, and then going from there, so kind of like working from down up. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are only so many. Now, the body's very kinetic. It, it, a lot of stuff influences. Nothing is in a vacuum, but there are only so many things that can go wrong in a human in mm-hmm. a human body over the course of a squat. There are a lot of them, but if you go down a checklist, then you're going to eventually find some restrictions. They might be interrelated. Exactly. And interlocking, but there's like there's a limited set of problems that could occur. Yeah, yeah, I mean, usually it's not too, too complex. And if it's like ridiculously complex, I won't lie, I'll, I'll probably refer them to someone who's <laughs> been dealing with that type of work for a long, long time, maybe right. specializes just in weightlifters. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, I mean, usually it's kind of a lot of obvious suspects and you, know, you can only squat so many different ways and you can deadlift so many different ways. It's usually gonna be one of these two issues or three issues. And we're talking a lot about strength athletes because I mean, that's what we really cover yeah. at Barben. But a lot of your work is, is based around being accessible to a general population and helping athletes of all different types from desk workers who are just trying to get that session in before work to you know semi-competitive athletes to the weekend warriors to people who are just trying to feel a little better. So it's not like, it's not like you're working with 100% strength mm-hmm. athletes. And one thing that I really like about your content, and I think that you're very well known for, is taking these concepts and distilling it down into a format that's easy for people to adhere to on a regular basis. Right. And the first question I want to ask you related to that is, okay, I've heard I've heard this like said four different ways, but stretching, is it something to, that to see progress you truly have to do every day? If I miss a day of stretching, am I going to be taking two steps back? You know, I think it's all about consistency with anything you do. Mm-hmm. If you just take too long of a break, your body's just going to, it's like adapts in the opposite direction. Right. It's not going to progress. Um, you know, I think if you're doing things like working out all the time and you're putting your body through certain ranges of motion, you're probably not going to lose it. It's usually if you're just not doing anything for a long time and you're not moving in the way you should be or for your activity, then that's where it gets a little bit sticky. Yeah. But for me, I like to do a little bit of something every single day. Um, and if you skip a day, it's probably not going to be that big of a deal. Again, it depends on your goal. If you're a high-level athlete, maybe you probably want to spend a little bit more time on your body. But if you're just kind of the weekend warrior, just like to lift maybe three, four times a week, uh, scale it back. Uh-huh. And then if you're feeling a little bit tighter during a session or two weeks later you're doing a session, you're like, ah, this does not feel right, then just ramp up a little bit on the, on the side. Mm-hmm. Now, this is a bit of a segue because I, I do want to talk about your book here in a second. Um, when it comes to the amount of time put in consistently, so consistent work, you know, what you can adhere to is the best program. The best exactly. diet is one you can adhere to. Yep. The best training protocol is one you can adhere to. When it comes to a mobility or flexibility routine, and I say both because I don't want to get called out for using those interchangeably <laughs> again for all of you very astute listeners who have called us out on that before, you know, how much is someone like the say recreational lifter, someone who's lifting three or four times a week, probably not setting any national or international records, Mm -hmm. but they want to keep some muscle mass, maybe build some muscle mass, build that strength. How long per day should they, in an ideal world, do dedicated mobility or flexibility work? So for my book, I kept it at nine minutes uh, just because through my membership site with thousands of members, uh, I found great results with something like nine minutes. It's also you know, not intimidating right. where it's like, oh, I gotta do 30 minutes of this class of yoga or stretching. Um, Cause you'll just, you won't do it. It right. comes back to you know, the best program is the one you can stick to. Uh, but I always say, if you need a little bit more, you can definitely up uh, the amount of time. Uh, but you know, I like nine minutes, 18 minutes, 20 minutes. Uh, and then I also like to potentially just stick it in 
during your warm up. Uh-huh. And that's another great way to fit it in without really thinking about it too much. Is you're going to have to warm up anyways, or you should be warming up. Um, put that information or put that uh, exercise in before you, you train. Now, what about all the people who say you st- shouldn't do any sort of power form stuff. <laughs> static stretching uh, or passive stretching before a workout? Yeah, so it might be a little bit different with your crowd, but. Uh, again, you know, the studies are saying, you know, you decrease power if you hold a static stretch for this long, but usually that's when it's a long duration hold. So it's not a 30 second to a minute hold. It's, it's much longer when you're statically stretching. Uh, but I also don't, so I don't mind it because I don't think it's going to apply to most people anyways. I mean, if your max on squat is, you know, 315, are you really going to be squatting 315 max that session? Most people won't, you know, they're going to scale it back. Uh, but there's studies saying it's going to get mitigated anyways if you go through a proper warm up. So let's say you start off with some static stretching and then you follow it up with, you know, a dynamic warm up. Right. And then you do something to, you know, that's a little bit more explosive, fire up the CNS. Um, you know, by that time, it's usually, you know, you probably won't see that big of a difference. So your book is called Better Stretching, mm-hmm. subtitle. Subtitles for books are my favorite. I don't care about <laughs> titles. I'm all about subtitles. Nine minutes a day to greater flexibility, less pain, and enhanced performance, the Joe Therapy way. And then your real name, Joe Yoon, is on the cover. <laughs> yes, it is. So yeah, you, so I want to make sure. Um, you could legally change your name to Joe Therapy, and I'm sure it would be fine. Here's, here's my question. Are you worried that next year someone's going to come out with eight minutes a day to greater flex? It's like that scene in Half Baked. <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. know if you've ever seen the movie where no, he's like, say, I probably eight should. So I'm probably going to get ripped on it when I say I didn't watch it. <laughs> it's like there, there's, a, there's a scene where it, I think it's in Half Baked. The character goes, You know, eight minute abs? I'm going to release seven minute abs. <laughs> yeah, it's just going to keep going down I'm and gonna down. Make, I'm going to make millions of dollars. But like, are, are you, you know, are, are you concerned at all that like is that nine minutes a day is that like the bare minimum i mean you say you you came up with this after feedback from thousands Mm -hmm. of of clients and members on on your online portal um but uh, tell me i I really want to like dig into that that time period nine minutes like what am i doing in those nine minutes oh so oh this is perfect and also the the title and you'll probably get a lot of feedback on this uh especially because there's a lot of evidence coming in saying oh you know uh, stretching doesn't uh, enhance performance it doesn't decrease injury and I'm, I'm very aware of this stuff but i i think of it i spin it a little bit where if you're trying to do an exercise like a squat and you have someone coaching you oh ass to grass or go to this depth and you can't get to those positions in my opinion it's going to help you decrease injury in that standpoint. Okay. Um, so I know you'll probably get some questions like, oh, that's bullshit. Like, uh, you can't decrease injuries. All the study is saying uh, it won't. But, you know, I think, you know, working with a lot of these high level athletes that, you know, getting into certain positions are very important, helps prevent some injuries. Um, and then also in the nine minutes, again, I keep, keep it very quick, but I combine it with strength exercises as well, which a lot of people don't know. They kind of see me as a one trick pony. Uh-huh. He's just the stretching guy. But my first job was a personal trainer. Uh, so I make sure that in the book, I talk a little bit about the strengthening aspect and how important it is to put into a program. So even if it's this is just a stretching book, I want to make sure that people know you have to strength train a little bit as well to make these flexibility gains last. And also that will help with injury prevention too. Mm-hmm. So they see the title, Better Stretching. It's only stretching. It's a lot more than that. It, it is interesting because the, the cover, which I, I really like, you're on the cover. <laughs> I mean, we, we see you. Mm. Um, and if you had asked me just to look at this book from to, to judge a book by its cover without knowing more about sure, you, sure. I wouldn't necessarily think that there was discussion about resistance training exactly, and hypertrophic yeah. response or anything like that. But that is a big part of of what you do. Is there anyone else in the fitness industry who maybe inspired you or whose work you admire when it comes to combining the mobility, mobility flexibility information with the resistance training and, and muscle building and strength training? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Kelly Starrett is, you know, I call him like the OG of uh, this therapy. I mean, he made everything boom. Yeah, uh, this was Sup- not- Supple Leopard. Supple Leopard, I have both copies. And none of this was cool before he came out. But he came out with this and did all the YouTube videos, and it changed everything. Yeah. Um, you know, I think 
it kind of sucks for him a little bit because he was all about smashing, 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 where now the evidence is like, maybe you shouldn't be pressing as hard maybe anymore. Maybe you shouldn't just be punching yourself with like a, a plastic implement all exactly. day. Exactly, yeah, yeah. But I think people need to remember, he's the one who kind of opened the, mm. the gates here. So yeah. none of us probably would exist unless he came out and was the first person out there. Yeah. So he definitely, uh, I think, set the bar early on and really helped open people's eyes about movement um, you know, before loading. I think it's interesting too, Kelly Sturette, like meeting you in person, you're a pre- like you're a pretty big guy, and I mean that in a good way. Like you're <laughs> yeah. you're you're pretty you're pretty tall. You're pretty muscular. Like you're you're clearly someone who you know has touched a barbell before. Let's put it that way. Yeah. A you, lot more before than <laughs> recently. It's been a little yeah, bit. People get busy. Yeah. People go, but you meet Kelly Sturette, and I was fortunate enough to meet him a few years ago. He's massive. I remember watching his videos and I'm like, this guy is fucking jacked. He is, and he is so strong. The dude, the dude can lift it, like can lift a house. And he's very supple too on top of it. And it's interesting because I think he was such a good ambassador for that. He was such a good kind of first wave of that because it wasn't, you know, he was very big in the CrossFit community and still, still is heavily involved in the CrossFit community and CrossFitters, weren't seeing this guy, like this guy does not look like a yoga instructor, like exactly. the stereotypical thing that maybe lifters might run away from. He's not skinny, he's not waif thin. The dude has some power behind him. Oh, I mean, yeah. I've seen him power clean up like 315 pounds, like it was you know, an empty Coke can- bottle or something <laughs> like that. You <laughs> know what I mean? Cake. He's He's a very strong dude and I think he was a good, just like you are the face of your own brand, he was a very good ambassador for, the, for what he was promoting. He's like, I'm supple. I'm strong, like I, I walk the walk and I and I look yeah. the part. And so it, it's interesting you bring him up as an early inspiration. Yeah, I mean, nothing, you know, a lot of us would not be here without his, his first of all, his knowledge. Mm. And, and now I think he's evolving too, yeah. you know? It's not just smash, smash, smash. Now he's talking a little bit about the stuff that's coming out that you see in the evidence. So right. I think it's great. It, it's interesting because he... He did talk a lot about smashing and that like self myofascial release was such a big part of what he did back then, maybe a little less of a, a highlight or less of a part of what he does now. But he had this hip opener video, like how to open up your hips before a squat. That was kind of this dynamic, um, dynamic hip opener. And I've been to multiple CrossFit gyms today. This is like, he probably released this video 10 years ago yeah, at this yeah. point. And I've been to multiple CrossFit gyms in the past three to four years, and I've seen multiple powerlifters and weightlifters in the past three to four years use an adapted version of the hip opening sequence that he popularized via YouTube. And I would guess most of those coaches and athletes, no fault of their own, don't actually know where that originated because it's just been passed down so many times. And it's so amazing to me how this one video that he released at CrossFit San Francisco, you know, Outside, 10 years probably, ago, yeah, that, impacts how yeah. so many, literally thousands of people warm up today. It's amazing. It's that's why I love the social media aspect of things. You know, some people there's like, oh, it's so bad for you. But I always like to think of the pros. Right. It's like you can reach so many people. And if you're putting good information out there, if your intentions are good, then it's great because you reach so many more people and you can help those people. And things like that, yeah. You might do a pigeon pose, you'd be like, Oh, Kelly Starrett, huh? Or something like <laughs> Oh, lacrosse ball. Oh, Kelly Starrett. Uh, but that's, I think that's great because it showed that people really cared about what he was doing. Where is, uh, what's the next stage for your career? I mean, this is, is, is this your first book? First book. And okay. yeah, a lot of this stuff happened very quickly for okay. me with the social media and the book. Um, yeah, so for me, the next, you know, it's been probably three years since I started social media. Uh, in the next three years, I just want to continue to try to reach more people and try to put, again, more good information in more people's hands. Right. Uh, you know, I live kind of in this bubble and I, you know, I'm not as well seen as some of the, these other people. Uh, but I want to make sure that I'm making people move better yeah. and then feeling better at the same time. Where do you see expanding your own knowledge base? Because something you talked about a few times during mm-hmm. this recording, which is, I really like hearing, is, you know, learning more changing the way you think, referencing how someone like Kelly Starrett has changed his approach and evolved with more evidence coming out. You know, where are some areas of wellness and movement that you think you could grow with and grow in? Yeah, I mean, this is tough because I'm a massage therapist, um, you know, by trade, and a lot of evidence is coming out saying, you know, maybe the manual therapy isn't the best and, um, 
you know, maybe stretching is not the best. So, so I'm like, damn, it's, <laughs> this is, <laughs> that's what this, I do. This is what I do. This is my career. <clears throat> but I don't think that I need to necessarily not do it, but use the, this evidence and make sure that the narrative is correct. Mm. A lot of these evidence based people that I'm very good friends with, and a lot of the people I hang out with are very evidence based. Yeah. Um, it's what you tell people. It's not what you're doing to them, right. it's what you're telling them. Because if I'm a massage therapist, I'm like, you're breaking down the adhesions, blah, blah, blah. They're like, he's a quack, like don't, you know, don't go to him. But if you're just saying, hey, it's a neurological change, it's gonna give you a little bit more range of motion, and then let's go do some exercise and load you, then it's okay. Or at, at least it's better than what I said before. Uh, so I just like to hang out with people who are, first of all, smarter than I am because I'm gonna learn so much more. and. Um, you know, just learn from them as well on top of just looking into some you know, extra reading and research. Well, Joe, where is the best place for people to keep up to date with what you're doing and for how your career and approach evolves as your knowledge base evolves? Yeah, so my first home is Instagram. Uh, so you can find me at Joe Therapy on Instagram and most social channels like YouTube and Facebook. Um, and joetherapy.com, but usually those are the best places to find me where I'm always updating what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, yeah, and then the book you can also find on betterstretching.com, which I made it very easy for people to find. <laughs> <laughs> betterstretching.com, and then I put all the links to all the popular uh, retailers. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks so much for joining us today, no, Joe. Thank you for having me. It's been amazing.